Emily's colleague here at the University, she's been here for about five years, and she's mainly a qualitative researcher by background, but she's beginning to do a few more and more mixed method uh, research, and she's doing a lot of research in the community, which is very research community based. Um, she, I found her talking to Kit Jones earlier, and uh, she was telling me about that conversation, she said that she used to be a risk taker very badly burned in the process, but Kip has encouraged her to take more risks again. And she pointed out the uh, JFK quote in the middle there, those who dare to fail miserably can achieve greatly. So I think it's kind of given her a new impetus to, uh, so we'll see where that takes you, Emily. We'll okay. see. So I'm going to hand over to Emily. Well, thank you very much for coming to listen to me today. Um, basically, in this presentation, I will share with you some of my experiences as a community-based action researcher over the past 12 years. And perhaps, you know, pick up what qualitative researchers could learn from these experiences, whether, you know, the experiences could be good, some of them could be bad, but just try to pick up what we could learn from these in order to achieve impact. But I think the first thing that we need to recognize, first of all, is this, you know, as qualitative researchers, we actually already have the skills um, to help us maximize social impact. As qualitative researchers, we understand the importance of establishing rapport. We know the importance of listening, of empathizing with our participants. We understand how to relate with people. And we are curious and we try to understand in depth what it's like, you know, from, from our participants' um, perspective. And for us qualitative researchers, we are also quite reflective, which enables us to step back um, to see things more clearly. So this is very important. These are some of the skills that, as you will see later on, that I try to tap into in order to, to achieve impact. And we know that not all researchers have these skills, but I trust that as qualitative researchers, we already have these skills and we just need to learn how to maximize these skills in order to achieve impact. Okay. So in order to achieve impact, we also need to be able to generate evidence in order to support our claims. Although it is not bad to be passionate about what we do, quite often passion alone is not good enough. Um, from my experience as an action researcher, I'm usually driven by passion and conviction for positive social change whether it is about improving the experiences of black and minority ethnic groups, you know, to promote the equality and diversity in higher education and healthcare, often I'm driven by, by passion for what I do because I believe that all human beings have equal human rights. However, stating what we believe in may not be sufficient, especially when we are dealing with people who may not share the same beliefs as we do. So it is really important for us to be able to say what we need to say, but also be able to provide evidence to support our arguments. As qualitative researchers, we have been trained um, to do this. You know, our training as qualitative researchers enables us to use rigorous research methods to generate robust evidence um, to support our claims. So I'll give you some examples of, um, from my own experience, where in this work, um, to my favor. And this first example is actually based um, in some of the work that I've done here at Keele University. And it's about um, an action research project on internationalization. And basically, I use an action research approach here where we try to explore what internationalization means to staff and students. We wanted to raise critical awareness about the issues related with internationalization. But also at the same time, we don't just talk about the issues, but we try to generate ideas on how we could address these issues and then encourage active engagement in order to implement some of these actions. So it's not just about carrying out research, but also generating ideas um, to implement action. Okay? So we did it in several stages. So we have six stages here. The first stage is really the research stage where we try to generate evidence. So we have the scopes, scoping, I didn't know that that would turn up. It's a scoping and generation of insights, so we, we try to um, collect data from there to support our evidence base. 
And then once you have your evidence base, you know, prioritize some of the issues because you couldn't really do everything at the same time. So the second stage is you have to prioritize, you plan your action, and then you implement the action, monitor and evaluate it, and then you reflect before you move forward, and then you share the processes and outcomes of your work. So I'll talk you through this bit by bit. So the first stage is the World Cafe. Quite often when we do research in qualitative, um, you know, with qualitative research, we could do interviews, we could do focus group discussions, we could do diaries, photo voice, and so on. But for this particular project, we, we ran a, a World Cafe event. It's very similar to the focus group, except that the World Cafe event um, could facilitate large group discussions. And basically, it's based on the premise that people would be more open to conversations when they're in a more relaxed and comfortable environment. So it's based on you know, encouraging people to listen, to understand, you know, move around, play, doodle if they want to, and really share and connect ideas with other people in that room and spend some time to, to reflect as well on the issues being presented. So what we did here at Keele University, um, we, we advertised the event very widely, posters, emails, and, and encouraged people to attend. We had that poster scattered around campus, and you can see the free lunch and cakes served um, to entice some students to come, you know, free food, you know, students will come. Uh, but we, we, had, we had that. We organized the, the room like it was a party, so you know, it's just really encouraging people to come in and join us. I had some research assistants to welcome them um, at the entrance. And basically, this is where we get their informed consent. So they are, the, the participants are informed what's going on in the room and they, they sign their consent form as, as part of our, our ethics. And then they are encouraged to, you know, to help themselves with the food, um, mingle, and, and share their thoughts and ideas on internationalization with other people in the room. So that particular event was quite successful. Um, we had more than 80 people turning up at that event. We have staff, um, international, and home students coming in there. And they were all just really mingling and sharing ideas with, with, with the other people in there. I had volunteer researchers, research um, students scribing um, some of the ideas. And as you can see here, we had tablecloths, so people can actually scribble on the tablecloths as well, so we could actually capture their insights in that way. If you can also notice here, we have um, menus, if you like, but they're really topic guides, so people can understand what's being discussed in that particular context. And if people don't have a lot of time to spend in the room, we also have a wall at the back of the room where they can just you know post their thoughts and ideas about internationalization some of the ideas that they they have to address some of the issues so they can just post them there read around and, and they can just do if they don't have enough time so that's what happened with the world cafe and we transcribed all of the tablecloths we transcribed the um, order recordings because we recorded the discussions as well um, and we also transcribed the post-it notes. So we transcribed them, had transcripts, and analyzed them using thematic analysis. And the next stage was really to prioritize um, and plan action. So once we've analyzed them, we've organized another event, presented some of the themes from the thematic analysis, and planned what we're going to do about the issues raised from the World Cafe. So we ran a pilot after the second stage piloted some events in the halls of residence. We tried to monitor and evaluate all of these events. And then in the end, you know, we, we had to engage with, with reflection and you know, some of the recommendations that we'll take out of, of this um, project. So one of the suggestions was to continue to support events to promote internationalization here at Kiel. This project was done in 2010. It is now 2014. We've been running the Kiel World Festival over the past five years. And it's not, it has now become an integral part of Keele University's internationalization agenda. So we're really quite proud of that. I think it's because also we have sufficient evidence to suggest that you know, internationalization can really enrich um, students and staff experiences. We've had that evidence base, so it was easier um, to um, encourage other people to take part in these events and to um, support the advocacy more widely. 
Now, in addition to the Kiel World Festival, we also had enough evidence to suggest that students, you know, they need to have opportunities to reflect about intercultural learning and dialogue. So when I asked for funding um, to develop an online resource to facilitate this, it was quite easy um, to get that support because we did have evidence to, to support our claims. So that's when we, we developed Kiel International Reflections, which is also an online resource to discuss and reflect about internationalization and intercultural learning. So the moral of the story here, um, it is good to be passionate about our work, but if we really want to make an impact, we need to generate evidence to back up our claims. With evidence, it is easier for us to convince others that what we are trying to achieve is worthwhile. Okay? So that's the first point that I wanted to share. The next point is really about involving your participants. And I think this is at the core of you know, participatory action research, which is the approach that I usually try to, try to use. And this is not just about you know, interviewing your participants, involving them in that way. No, this is not just about that. It is about involving your participants in most stages of the process, from forming the research questions, to designing the methods, collecting and analyzing data, implementing the action, evaluating, monitoring, disseminating, and so on. You need to engage them in most, stage of the, most stages of the process. And participant engagement is particularly useful because first of all, it is a way for us to, to surface meaningful and in-depth information for your project, you know, as I was telling earlier, to, to generate evidence. But it also enables your participants to steer the focus of your research and it gives them the opportunity also to recognize and develop their skills through their involvement. And I will show you some examples of how, I, of how this might work in practice. So an example that I will show you here is another action research project that I've been doing here at Kiel. It's um, around life as a migrant nurse here in the UK. And basically the aim of that project was to explore the experiences of being a migrant nurse here and use the information from that research in order to inform and influence potential plans to address emerging issues. So as usual, with, with an action research project, you'll have several stages in the process. So this one had four stages. First, you establish rapport, you plan, you try to compile insights and their experiences, you analyze and synthesize the information, and then you disseminate and think about the next action steps. So as far as the um, data collection, if you like, is concerned, um, the research involved asking the participants to keep a reflective diary for a period of six weeks. So they were recording some of their thoughts and reflections of being a migrant nurse here in the UK. So that happened for six weeks. And after that six week period, they, they tried to share their diary entries with other participants through the World Cafe event. So as you may notice, I really enjoy organizing World Cafe events because it really gets people to, to talk and discuss um, their experiences in, in a very relaxed, manner. So we, we discussed the diary entries through a World Cafe event, we transcribed the discussions, we also transcribed their diaries, analyzed um, using IPA, and then um, the insights from, from the research were shared to a wider audience through a stakeholder event, and the migrant nurses were actually also involved in organizing this event. This is where they also presented um, some of the key issues from the research and they also discussed some of the action steps in the process. So as usual, we had posters during that event. They invited their family members, they invited their managers, they, they invited the media. And the nurses were actually there talking about their experiences as well. You know, we had the posters around the room highlighting some of the themes from the research. They talked about their first steps here in the UK, how they adjusted to life here in the UK, what it was like working in the NHS, um, thinking about some of the language issues that they encounter and how they balance their work and life. So all of these things they discussed at that stakeholder event. But in the process, what really made me surprised was they really highlighted this issue on racial microaggression. And this was something that I didn't anticipate when, you know, when I prepared my proposal. 
And basically, just to give you a very brief background, what we mean by racial microaggression are the subtle forms of racism. Um, these are very brief, commonplace, daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities. They could be intentional or unintentional, and they usually communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults. And this was something that I didn't really anticipate when, when we were carrying out this project. And the nurses were really talking about how they felt that they were being bullied, but it was really very subtle, so they couldn't really file a complaint against it. They felt that their skills are being downgraded because they are migrants, that they are being fairly uh, unfairly treated. There are also barriers to their progression, like barriers to promotion and training. And there are subtle forms of racism as well from patients and managers. So these are things that I didn't really anticipate when I prepared the proposal. And although, although racial microaggression wasn't the original focus of the project, I just wanted to learn you know, what it is like. But this is you know, what, what they highlighted. By engaging them with the use of diaries, the World Cafe, there was a safe and, and confidential space for them to share their stories. So it really enabled them to, to steer the focus of the study to matters that were most important to them. And I think as qualitative researchers, this, is, oh, this actually comes natural for us, really, um, that we, we try to engage our participants in the process and really let them say what is important for them. So that's one example of, of engaging the participants. But if I can just go back, how many years ago was it, Carla? Nearly 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD at City University. And this is the part where I really um, engaged the participants from designing the, research, uh, designing the project onwards. But I'll just give you a brief background on that. So as I said, um, I did this as part of my PhD. I was basically reading around the literature on critical health psychology. And at that time, I have noticed that there was a lot of discussion concerning the need for the field to move towards greater practice and action orientation. And based from those discussions in the literature, it really made me reflect what, what I could do to make my research meaningful and useful to communities especially among those who are considered marginalized or disadvantaged. So this is where it stemmed from. And I started this work initially by contacting relevant organizations that I can potentially work with. And I ended up working with an organization called the Popular Education for People's Empowerment. And at that time, they were working with the indigenous Aita community in the Philippines. Now, the Aitas, they are the earliest inhabitants of, of our country in the Philippines. It's a very small minority group. Um, but in recent years, they've become increasingly marginalized because of the uh, destructive volcanic eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. So after that eruption, they've become very vulnerable from economic exploitation because majority of them um, also lack formal education, so they couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't count. So it was easy for other people to actually cheat or you know, to, um, to exploit them economically in that way. So this is where um, the project stem from. So with action research, I keep mentioning it goes through several stages. For this particular one, we had seven stages. Well, that was the plan anyway. First, to establish rapport and plan with your participants. You generate knowledge with your participants. You validate the information. You generate recommendations for action. You plan the action. You implement it. And then you follow it up later on. So in terms of the first stage, in terms of establishing rapport and planning, we basically organized several community visits and community workshops to really engage the community in designing and informing the research aims and agenda for this particular piece of work. And this is what they came up with. Um, their main aim really was to achieve community development. Okay? And the way to achieve community development is through education. But, it, but this is not about mainstream education. This is about an alternative learning system that incorporates their culture, their way of life, their livelihood, and also injecting a little bit of health promotion into the curriculum. So you could forward education in order to achieve um, community development. 
And one thing that, that, that I just wanted to highlight here is that they are using participatory action research as a tool in order to forward this agenda, but it should be the ITA community taking hold of the goal. It should be the ITA community really steering the focus of, of this project and really driving this project forward. So this was pretty clear right from the start. So that's what we had for the first stage. For the second stage, we, we call it, you know, in research terms, this is data collection. Uh, but we don't really collect the data. You know, we try to generate and surface knowledge with the community. So we had several workshops. We had interviews and focus group discussions. Really rich qualitative data um, as a result. We had video, video and photo collections. And I also had my little notebook, you know. I had my reflective diary taking note of my observation and also engaged in informal storytelling with, with the IDA community um, in the process. So that's what we had for stage two. After that, we organized a community meeting in order to discuss some of the things that were coming up from, from the second stage. So we had local residents coming in, visitors, traders, teachers, volunteers, and leaders really discussing some of the main issues from the work. And from there, we um, generated an action matrix um, as a community. So some of the plans here, they basically wanted to incorporate Gabi production. Gabi is a kind of fruit crop in the Philippines. So they could learn how to plant Gabi, but at the same time, they're learning how to read, write, and count because they will have to read the manual count. One seedling, two seedling, three seedling. So they're learning how to count. Um, they're, they're gaining literacy and numeracy skills, but at the same time, um, you know, improving their livelihood too. So they had that plan um, for Gabi production. They also planned to build a literacy center in the community. They planned to organize a pool of leaders, you know, the ITA leaders. They wanted to set up their own price list so they have more control over trade. And they also wanted better roads and better communal areas in their community. So, so that was the plan anyway. So in terms of the next stages, that was the plan. This is um, what we wanted to do. We wanted to implement the plans shortly after that um, community meeting. And then I'll go back to the field to follow it up. And while that's going on in, in the field, I would go back to my desk, you know, do my analysis, because I was a PhD student at that time, write it up, disseminate the research, and also do a little bit of advocacy work on the side, you know, to raise awareness about the issues, you know, faced by the ITA community, and also generate a little bit of funds, you know, to, to support the alternative learning system, okay? So that was the plan. I would like you to hold on to that thought for a while and we will discuss what happened next in reality. We will see whether they actually happened, but just hold on to that thought for now. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to that later. But the main point that I wanted to share here is the importance of involving your participants in the process. It was useful for both researchers and participants because the project itself was being steered by the real experts. And what I mean by the real experts are the people who are experiencing those circumstances themselves. And also by involving your participants in the process, they are also recognizing that, hey, you know, we have skills, we have a voice, there are issues going on in our community. Let's talk about it and let's do something about it. So in a way, it's generating more awareness and, and more social cohesion, if you like, in the process. So that was very useful. Now the next point that I wanted to highlight is the importance of developing partnerships. And this is something that we should never underestimate. Um, we know that interdisciplinary partnerships are useful. With my work as a health psychologist, I work with colleagues from the School of Medicine, I work with colleagues from the School of Nursing, Education, and so on. But if we really want to make lasting impact, we really need to move beyond the confines of our academic circles and try to engage more with wider stakeholders. So if you recall with the IPA project, um, there are several key players in that particular project. The IPA community are at the forefront. But we also had non-governmental organizations. We had government units. And my role as a critical health psychologist was really quite tiny in comparison to the others because 
I was merely facilitating the research. They are the ones um, planning the action and they are also the ones, the community on the ground, implementing the action. My role was just to facilitate the research, generate that evidence base to inform the action plan. So it's important that you have partners who can actually do things on the ground. So that's what I was doing in the Philippines, but I'm also doing the same thing here in the UK. Um, at the moment, I'm really immersed in health literacy work. Um, I'm very much involved with um, health literacy here in Stoke-on-Trent, and I work very closely with Stoke-on-Trent City Council. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've been involved in a participatory action research project looking at the experiences of South Asian men and young men with diabetes. And I was commissioned um, to facilitate participatory action research using both quantitative and qualitative research. Um, for this particular research, we, we used photo voice to facilitate the research in order to really understand what it is like to have diabetes if you're a young man or if you are a South Asian man. And to, to use the information that you get from the research in order to inform pilot interventions that Stoke and Trent City Council could run later on. So it is important that we, need, that, that we have this kind of partnership. And this was happening since 2010, 2011. We're still carrying on with more work. We're establishing a baseline health literacy in the area so we understand what is the current um, literacy level in Stoke and Trent so we can design interventions that would be suitable for your target audience. We are assessing whether the materials out there are readable and you know, whether it actually matches the literacy skills of your, of your target audience. And this particular partnership is continuing to grow and blossom. We always keep in touch. We share our research and you know, they try to, uh, we try to listen and understand the circumstances on the ground. And we have partners who can actually make things happen on the ground. So that's what I'm doing at the local level at the moment. But on a national level, I'm also part of Health Literacy UK. I'm part of the steering group. And this particular group involves patients and patient groups. We involve healthcare practitioners and providers, teachers, policy makers, non-governmental organizations, and so on. And it's really important that, that we engage people in this way, not just academics, if we really want to make a difference in society. So that's the point that I was trying to make. You know, we, 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 we really need to form and develop partnerships, not just within academia. We need to be able to engage with groups that can actually make real and sustainable changes on the ground. And this is something that I'm consciously trying to inject in my own research and practice. Now, after you've done all that work, it's also important that you're able to spread the word and to share your work more widely. You know, it's not enough to just share it with people who already know what you're doing. You know, you need to share it with, with others so you, you, you could um, spread the word if you like. Don't keep it to yourself, disseminate. And it's not just about publishing articles and it's not just about sharing your work at conferences. These are not enough. We need to be able to share our work with those who can benefit from or who can do something with our work, and this is something that I've been doing right from the start. Um, I can still remember um, when I was a master's student, and yes, Carla would remember this as well. Um, as part of my master's at City University, I actually did a discourse analysis of the International Labor Organization's Convention 182 on the Worst Forms of Child Labor. And, and basically, what happened in that um, discourse analysis is we, we suggested that, okay, there's a lot of rhetoric surrounding you know, the elimination of first forms of child labor, but the convention still promotes the maintenance of existing hierarchies of power by emphasizing legislative structures and basically just consulting um, organizations, organization of employers and workers. So the children themselves are put to the side and they're placed in a very passive role. So, that was that. Um, we recommended that the convention be re revised, so I wrote an article on it and said, you know, it needs to be revised and children need to be given a more active role in the process, so I had that published. But I didn't stop there. Um, I was very ambitious when I was younger and quite risky at that time. 
So what I did, I tried to write to um, government officials. I actually wrote to Tony Blair. I wrote to um, to the department. What do you call it? That's DFID, Department for International Development. And I also wrote to senators in my country, uh, to the Department of Labor and Employment, Department of Social Welfare and Development. I went to ILO meetings and so on and so forth. So did a lot of work. What did I get? Um, I got a small note from Tony Blair's office um, to say that uh, thank you very much for your letter. We acknowledge that we got it. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was it. So that wasn't very good. Never heard from it again. But to be fair, I had a more positive response from the Philippine government. Um, they sent me packs and lots of information about what they've been doing on the ground. Um, unfortunately, they said it's probably not best to change the convention because it takes a lot of work <laughs> and advocacy to, to change the discourses surrounding the convention. So we didn't really manage to do that. But they reassured me that you know they're trying to engage the children in the process as well. You know they, they try to hear the children's voices and their families as well. And it's not always just about the organization of employers and workers. So I was very young at that time, um, and I stopped there. I, I just carried on, did my PhD, and just left the child labor work there. Just reassured that um, at least in the Philippines they're trying to do something about it on the ground. But. Little, little did I know that five years down the line, this activist side of me will be reignited by a certain TV show called Harry and Paul. Um, how many of you here know about this TV show? No? Okay. Well, it was basically in September 2008. Um, they broadcasted this um, clip portraying a Filipino maid as a sex slave. Um, in their show and they thought it was fun. But I'll, I'll just show you the clip and you can judge for yourself. Good morning, Coach B. I'll take that. What's up? What's going on here? Not a lot, I'm afraid. Our chums up the road wanted to see if we could make their Filipino maid with our northerner, but he's not having any of it. <laughs> Absolutely sorry for anyone who's in any way offended by the program. That wasn't our intention. Uh, the sketch in question, like the majority of Harry and Paul's work, clearly represents a preposterous situation. The comedy here, as in many other sketches in the series, is aimed at the 
appalling insensitivity of the British upper class, here represented by Enfield's character, rather than those characters played by Paul Whitehouse and the Filipino woman. How in Paul is a post-watership comedy sketch show well known for its exaggerated humour and absurd characters. It in no way represents real people and was never intended to offend or demean any viewer. Uh, it is our policy to work at all times in accordance with the requirements as set out by the broadcasters we supply. This was certainly the case throughout the entire production period of the series of Harry and Paul. The BBC was editorially happy with the show, was of course all decisions taken and made this clear in its response to, the letter, to a letter dated 3rd of October um, to the, um, the ambassador at the Embassy of the Philippines. Um, we certainly did not set out to intend to offend anybody. We absolutely recognised that there was a section of the Filipino community who were offended and to them we apologise for any offence taken. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Oh, Andrew Zane, Chairman of Tiger. Oh, Chief of Tech of Tiger Aspect. Thanks, Andrew. So that was it. Result? Um, we had an apology from the producers. We had an apology from the BBC as well. And, and we were quite pleased with that. We haven't really had any other protests after that scenario. So hopefully, we'll, we won't have to do it ever again. So after all of that hoo-ha, as an academic, I had to write about it. <laughs> So I, I wrote an editorial about that and also had open peer commentaries in the Journal of Health Psychology. So there was um, some academic discussion and, and debate um, surrounding the, the issues raised from that, from that particular scenario. So the main lesson here is if you, if you really want to make an impact, make sure that you, you spread the word and, and you, know, you try to reach as many people as you can. I'm not as media savvy as Kip and I hope that I am, but I am trying to learn. I don't tweet, I, I, I only use my father's Facebook as well. But you know, it, it would be very useful to, to spread the word more widely. And going back to, to the things that I was discussing earlier, make sure that you have enough evidence to support your claims. In our case, we had the petition and we had enough evidence to suggest that you know, uh, a section of the Filipino community was offended by the clip. You need to have enough partners in order to support your your advocacy. So we had several community organizations supporting this. And make sure that you have partnerships with people who can really make a difference. And in our case, we really had strong connections with the Philippine Embassy in London who could actually give this advocacy that extra push it needed. And, and that's the result that we've got. Okay. So that's, that's the other thing that I wanted to share. Off to the next point. After all you've done all that work, we, need, we also need to think about how the advocacy will sustain itself. You know, we need to think about the long-term consequences of the project and what will happen after you need to move on to the next. And so it is important to enable your, you know, the, the, enable the community to take ownership of the project and think about how they will be able to sustain the advocacy themselves once your role as a researcher has finished. So, Earlier, I told you to hold on to the thought about what happened, you know, with the ITAS. Um, the plan was to implement the action, you know, we had that action plan earlier. To implement it, I'll go back, follow it up. But while that's going on in the field, I'll be in London, writing up, you know, doing my advocacy and so on and so forth. So we'll see what happened next. So in London, yes, I did get on with my advocacy work. Um, yes, Carla will remember this as well. Um, I did organize um, several music festivals um, at, at City University at that time. Um, I had a photo and, and video exhibition, film screenings, and as part of the music festivals, you know, just imagine this, I had professors of economics doing the Morris dancing, and I had counseling psychologists doing, you know, some belly dancing, and I had the, the librarians rocking. So <laughs> it was a really good, fun, um, you know, fun set of events. Um, we raised a lot of awareness about what's going on um, with the ITAS in the Philippines, and we also raised um, some funds in order to support the advocacy and alternative learning system on the ground. Now, in terms of project outcomes in the community, they did say that they wanted to improve the roads. They managed to do that. It's just a matter of widening, widening the roads and you know, just to make it easier for the ITAS to transport their um, trade to, to the, to the lowland. So they've managed to do that. They also improved their communal areas. So in the past, they were just out there under the sun. 
And basically, what they just did, you know, just put some sticks and some leaves, and it just makes it more conducive um, to social gatherings. So they managed to do that as well. And in terms of, you know, the multipurpose cooperative, from the funds that we raised from the, from the fundraising, we managed to buy some animals and farming tools to help the Aitas with their, with their um, planting and, you know, harvesting their crops. And they set up their own multipurpose cooperative, which actually worked very well. So, in the end, at the end of the first action um, research cycle, we, we tried to reflect about um, whether, the, whether the project achieved its empowerment agenda. And come to think of it, yes, it helped to increase levels of social awareness and advocacy because it brought people together and you know, started to think about what's going on in the community. Individual and community skills were also enhanced so they learned how to read, write, and count, even if it was just very basic. You know, it's, it's a good start. Um, and because they've learned how to read and write, they also managed to exercise their right to vote. So they can now participate in, in the elections and, you know, it, it enhanced their political participation. Because of their multipurpose cooperative, they also had more control over their trade. And because of the research and organizing all of these meetings, we've had this space for critical thinking. You know, critical thinking was really encouraged you know, the ITAS, the, it's not enough to just accept the circumstances as a given, but actually question whether this should, whether this should be really what it should be about or whether they can do something about it. So space for critical thinking was also encouraged. Unfortunately, all these things are not enough. And I will show you some pictures here before and after pictures. Something rather tragic happened in the community and just want you to try to think about um, what happened next. Just before and after. So just looking at those pictures, you can actually get the sense of something something rather tragic happened on the ground. Some people might think, hmm, I wonder whether it's an earthquake, wonder whether it's a typhoon, because you know, in the Philippines, we, we get typhoons most of the time, or whether you know, they just had to re relocate, and so on. But basically, what happened there, if you recall, in this small project, one of the action plans to address low literacy was to build a literacy center. Do you remember that from the action plan? One of the action plans was to build a literacy center. Unfortunately, um, there was dispute over the land where the literacy center was built. And in October 2006, armed men invaded the community and brutally burned down their homes. So that's basically what happened in the pictures there. They, they basically burned down the, the community members' homes. Fortunately, no deaths resulted from the incident, and the literacy center was also spared. But understandably, members of the Ita, some members of the Aita community were traumatized from witnessing this, this event. So as reflected in this case, it is clear that facilitating action research can have far-reaching social consequences. Interventions can be developed and you know, it can also it can improve situations, but it can also have damaging repercussions. In this case, the structural and political changes needed in order to achieve empowerment will require more time and more action research, action research cycles, which could span across generations. And it is uncertain how many more action cycles will be needed to achieve that. So the main lesson that I've learned from this experience is we can do all of this work, you know, do a lot of action research, do a lot of advocacy, but action research and advocacy alone are not enough. We need to have the cooperation of those who are currently in power if we really want to make lasting and sustainable change. Okay. So I don't want to leave on that note, um, but the last point that I wanted to raise here is the importance of us being able to take care of ourselves I think when, when you do action research, it's, you know, there's a danger of you just trying to do everything and you sort of tend to forget about yourself. 
Um, it is not selfish to recognize our personal needs sometimes. We need to be honest with ourselves and really recognize when we need help, recognize our strengths and limitations, and make sure that we have enough academic and social support in order to help us um, recover if things don't go the way we plan. And I think this is where reflexivity also comes into the picture. You know, you need to spend a little bit of time as well in you know, reflecting about um, your circumstances, what's going on, how it is affecting you, and how it is affecting others as well. Now, in my case, I feel that I've been really blessed, um, that I've been surrounded by wonderful people around me um, through Thick and Thin. I have an amazing family. My husband is here right now. Um, I had a wonderful mentor. I have fantastic colleagues, you know, friends and family who really pick me up whenever things, you know, don't go the way I plan. And sometimes they've seen me melt down many times, but they've just been there, offered support, and just encouraged me to just carry on. Um, but it's really important that we are able to surround ourselves with people who can remind us that we are only human, we also have needs, and that we also need to be able to take care of ourselves sometimes. Okay? So I think I'm going to end it on that note. Um, if you have any questions or would like um, to discuss some of the issues raised here, um, that's my email, and you know, just feel free to have a chat if, if you'd like to know more. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I mean, that was fascinating. Thank you. We've got a few minutes just for any questions to any in person here today. We go to talk to you. Have a right in the microphone. So it's an observation, really, about that Harry and Paul or whatever it is. I found it quite interesting that the apology. They actually named all the actors and then said the Filipino woman. That they didn't actually name her. Yeah. And that's that's actually within an apology for disrespecting for the, the person. Yeah. I noticed that they apologised for any offence taken, taken for any yeah. offence caused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've we've observed that thing. But yeah. we'll just we'll just take Apology and just it's a step forward. Yes. It's just interesting how, as Miranda said as well, they sort of protect themselves. I mean, yes. They have to legally, but they protect yeah. themselves. And some people have noticed that, you know, especially with Tiger Aspect Productions, they said something like the BBC was editorially happy. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so, um, so it's it's okay, but we're yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they are sorry for the offense taken. It'll make them think twice the next time. Next time. Yeah, at least we, we made it explicit that, you know, we are offended by this. If, if we just kept silent, then they, they might think that it's okay, no one's offended. But, you know, but by making it explicit, then they are aware that it, it's not acceptable for us. And they've never done it again, which is <laughs> Um, I guess I'm just feeling a little bit of in awe of all that you've been involved in. But I was just wondering, how receptive was the ITO community when you first went in to do research? The ITO community? Yeah. They were very welcoming and they, they actually warmed to me very quickly. Um, the difficulty that I had on the ground was the gatekeepers actually, because they are very cautious of um, researchers coming in into the community because they've probably had researchers before coming and then go out and that's it, end of story. Um, as far as the idols were concerned, they were very warm and welcoming and they, they just let me in and it was really the gatekeepers. It took me a bit of time um, to, to really establish rapport with them, understandably because they're trying to protect the community as well. Yeah. But we, you know, we worked well in the end, which is, which is quite nice. I wouldn't say that it would be down to me. Um, I suppose on the ground, some of my partners, you know, especially with the Aita community, they, they try to work very closely with the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, you know, making sure that there are structures in place in order to 
um, you know, to support the community. I wouldn't pin it down to what I have done personally, but it's something wider that is beyond me, if that makes any sense. My role really is just to facilitate the, the research and, and then just carry on and see how people are going to take it. If you can facilitate the action as well, that would be great. But as I've noted in the end, you have to recognize that you have limitations as well. And you need to make sure that people on the ground are also able to carry things forward without you being there. I think, oh, just one more question. Oh, two very quick questions. Um, yeah, I have a quick one. Um, it's so, such an inspiring uh, method You just keep it open. <laughs> just just let the ethics committee aware of it. And it's it's quite good now because um some members of the ethics um panel, you know, they are aware that this is how action research happens and you know it's subject to change. So just make sure that you make it explicit in your proposal and say you know, things are subject to change and we will inform you if it does. Okay, one final question. Uh, thank you. It was a really inspiring uh, talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my question follows up from that really and it's about funding for research. Um, so it's kind of similar, similar way, really. We're not quite sure what we're going to be doing. Uh, how do you want to respond to that? How, how do you cost it? Mm. Okay. I'm just thinking of which example to pick. With the AITA project, um, I basically almost like parachuted in. They already have funding from Oxfam, you know, the organization. You know, they were already working with the AITA community. And I said, you know, before you carry on and implement your action, I think it might be best if we do a little bit of research first so we could inform how we go around this. So it was in a way, my research was self-funded because I was doing my PhD at that time. When it comes to my current work now, for example, with Stoke and Trent City Council doing action research on diabetes and health literacy, they will have these calls on, you know, uh, they want to, to commission a pro an action research project. And you, again, you make it explicit that these are the steps. You cost in some funding for an intervention without making it explicit what the intervention might be. So you cost in the research and all these things, and then you, you allocate some funds for the intervention without really knowing what that might be. And then they are open to that. Some, some funders are open to that. You just need to, to find which fund.